Hi, everybody. My name's Adam. I'm a general internist, so I am not a scientist. And I, I've mentioned this to a, a number of people. I study clinical reasoning, so how doctors in particular and medical students and residents make decisions. And I've been doing this almost a decade, not quite a decade. And I, was, I like to joke that no one really cared about what I did until about nine or 10 months ago. So without much ado, in about 20 minutes, I'm going to go over you know, 80 years of the history of clinical, clinical decision support systems, uh, how large language models work, how clinical reasoning works, uh, go over the data and the implications for the future. So let's, let's try to do this. So I always like to talk whenever, to, to have some large perspective here, because people talk about AI and artificial intelligence in medicine as if it is something new. This is the oldest reference that I've ever been able to find to the description of an artificial intelligence uh, system, which is from Bernard Shaw in 1918, describing how counting machines work uh, for a business, and then describing how that might work in a clinical setting. So in the clinics and hospitals of the near future, we may quite reasonably expect that the doctors will delegate all the preliminary work of diagnosis to machine operators. And then he goes on to describe all the flaws with human doctors uh, and describes the machine system and says, from such sources of error, machinery is free. This is 1918, when he finally published this, that's the Electric Ray Man is his essay, in a book in 1933, he called this essay The Robot Doctor. And the word robot had only been invented two years before in, um, in uh, Czechoslovakia. I also like to show this. So I, I would do a poll, but this is a large group. I, I like to ask people, when was the first diagnostic artificial intelligence invented? And people will invariably have guesses, like in the 1990s, maybe the 1970s. The actual answer is 1952. For comparison, ENIAC was first built in 1946. So we're talking six years after the first electronic computer was developed, doctors attempted to build a system that could make diagnoses like a human. And I love showing this, because I like to ask people uh, what era this magazine cover comes from. If you look at the clothes, you could probably figure it out. But this is from 1978. Artificial intelligence comes of age, and it's a description of Internist One, which was basically an attempt to encode Jack Meyer's brain, who was the uh, chair of the AMA and the, uh, the, 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 the president of the AMA and the chair of medicine at Pitt. Um, a, a very laudable figure, and actually if you read some of the published reports, so in 1982 there was a New England Journal Review article, Internist One already outperformed humans in difficult cases in 1982. So why do we care and why have people been interested about CDS um, or uh, clinical decision support systems? And the answer is it turns out, and this is not really remotely controversial in the year 2023, but doctors are pretty bad at making diagnoses in a way that really impacts patient care. Uh, this was a study published in BMJ you know, uh, two months ago, estimating that 800,000 Americans become annually disabled or die because of missed or delayed diagnoses. And these weren't rare things either. I think almost, yeah, almost half of the serious harms were from only 15 diseases. All right, so in order to talk about why LLMs in diagnosis are exciting, we have to very briefly talk about our current psychological understanding of how humans make medical decisions. So first comes a knowledge acquisition stage. Knowledge can come from the classroom, from medical school, from reading medical journals, point of care decision support, and probably most importantly from our patients and getting feedback from our patients. And it all goes through an encoding period in the brain. Uh, and then it's organized in our mind. And this has been work, uh, Elstein really first described this in the 70s, but has really been developed through the 90s through today as part of script theory. So the idea is doctors don't just memorize facts, we organize them into things that are called illness scripts, which might be uh, the pathophysiology of a disease, how it presents, who gets this disease, what medications treat it. And over time, we develop a series of these scripts that we can compare and contrast against. Uh, this is called a schema. Uh, so what happens when doctors see a patient? You start with the information gathering process, and then automatically, this is very influenced by obviously um, dual process theory, automatically the script library is activated, and the physician will almost without really 
ask, asking such a small number of questions, we'll develop a differential diagnosis. This actually was first identified in the late 1970s when, in studies of uh, medical students and attending physicians. And it turns out that both of them use very similar processes to interrogate patients, but the attending physicians would only ask three or four questions, whereas the medical students would talk for 20 minutes, and the attending physicians were still much more accurate. This is the automatic part of metacognition. There's also a second, more deliberate part. This is the second part of dual process theory, where there are all these different metacognitive models that have been described really since the 19th century. Uh, that might be Bayesian or probabilistic reasoning. Humans are pretty terrible about that, but this is something that we do. Uh, it might be pathophysiologic reasoning. And probably most exciting, what, what uh, internists like to talk about is a hypothetical deductive process of reasoning where we try out, accept, reject different hypotheses to narrow things down. And because nothing is ever simple, there's a complex interplay of these different metacognitive processes, some of them automatic, some of them deliberate. Well, why does this matter? So I've been studying clinical decision support and physician metacognition for a very long time. And one of the things that comes out, this is what's really exciting about this field, is going back to the 1950s, there's been this Ouroboros of physicians trying to describe how we think in order to teach a future generation, but also in order to build artificial intelligence systems, which directly feeds back in to the people who are building those systems, and there's this connection between them. What's really exciting is that basically until 2019, all CDS that doctors used were kind of top-down systems. They tried to model very specific cognitive processes. These might be Bayesian probabilistic models, something as simple as the Wells score going back to the 70s AAP help. Um, they might be expert systems, so Mycin is the classic example there. There's also internist one, and an expert system is basically, it's a logic tree, it's if-then statements. They can become very, very complicated. But they were all trying to model top-down. Language models have, has the clinical reasoning field very exciting, excited because they are bottom up. I am not a tech person. I am a medical educator and a historian, so nobody who is an expert at foundation models get mad at me. But very briefly, how language models work is they have a pre-training of massive amounts of human-generated text. If anybody has been following the legal cases, it does include a very large amount, perhaps 130,000 of pirated books, all the internet. Um, and then it goes through a neural network, and this is the pre-training process. I left this out, and effectively all it's doing is predicting the next token, and a token is a, is a part of a word. There's then a fine-tuning process. Yeah, it's all Star Trek. I'm making, I'm, that's the Wrath of Khan script there. There's then a fine-tuning process, um, reinforcement learning through human feedback, and it, the output ends up being something that is uncannily human. So the example I did is I, I this is just GPT-4, I told it that I was writing a Shakespeare in the Park uh, version of The Wrath of Khan, and I asked it for its help with a famous part, and it created, um, what, what, I can't even read my own writing, but it's great, right? It, it makes remarkably human-sounding text. Um, and mostly I did this so I could do the con meme. And of course, uh, there are also foundation models for image generators. This is just stable diffusion, and I just put a, a simple prompt in. I'm not good at this. There are some people who can create works of art with stable diffusion, not I. Okay, why do we care about this in the clinical reasoning process? So basically, since the early 90s with Bordage, we've realized that reasoning in script theory is semantic in nature, that it really has to do with word associations to the point that we explicitly teach our trainees to talk about semantic qualifiers. So here's an example of a bunch of different semantic qualifiers or word descriptions from a patient case. Um, this is a, this is a real patient, I actually have this patient's uh, family's permission to talk about this case. Uh, you put it through a large language model and you get out a differential that is remarkably human. And in fact, this is a patient who developed disseminated Mycobacterium bovis from his, um, from his BCG treatment for bladder cancer years before, who was misdiagnosed for months as having endocarditis. And you can see that is also the LLM's second um, second item on its differential. So this is what has the clinical reasoning community very, very excited and very, very anxious. 
we've always had these top-down models of attempting to model explicit metacognitive processes. And now, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I don't think there was anybody in the reasoning community who saw this happening, we have a bottom-up model. Now, one of these questions is here is, do LLMs make diagnoses via scripts? And the answer is no, it doesn't make diagnoses in a way that you or I make diagnoses, right? The inputs to my scripts involve real patients, real lived experience, me seeing actual human beings, but they create a very compelling simulacra of the reasoning process. Uh, and the question becomes, well, there's, there's multiple questions, I'll go over this, but the question becomes, is that good enough? So I want to briefly go over the data. One of the, one of the things that I like to point out to people is between, let's say, 1992 or 1993, that's the beginning of the AI winter in medicine, and 2019, there were about a dozen studies of AI CDS systems. In the last six months, there have been four times that number. So I'm going to try to summarize this field very, very briefly. So when we're talking about research, Important thing to know is that most people are talking, most people are doing research with general purpose commercial models. And if you've read any stories on this, they've almost certainly just been a GPT-3.5 Turbo or GPT-4 via ChatGPT. There are, is some data on Palm, which is what powers BARD, and one study on the original MedPalm. This is important because I talked about fine tuning. There are fine tuned models out there that no one has seen the performance of. One of the big ones is MedPalm 2 by Google. And then there's this Hippocratic AI. They have almost half a billion US in funding. Uh, and they're sitting there on this giant fine tuned model. And I've seen their, in, their internal benchmarks, but no one has actually tested it yet. So I want everybody to keep that in mind when we're talking about models. We're talking about the first draft of these technologies. So, Medical exams, this got all the, the, all the headlines. And this is just a chart that shows the improvement on MedQA, which is a multiple choice question database that's used for benchmarking over time. Uh, MedPalm2, that's Google's model, is now able to pass the USMLE with flying colors. Uh, here's an example of GPT-4. So 86.7 on the USMLE would be a 95th, 96th percentile pass rate. It's a little bit different each year, and they like to keep their scores proprietary. But you can see how passing standardized tests has improved dramatically over time. I honestly don't care about passing standardized tests. I think anyone here has actually cared for patients knows that this is not really a valid way to talk about physician or performance or clinical reasoning. So this also got a lot of headlines. This was also 3.5 Turbo. This is an older model about LLMs showing empathy mind you, as compared to <laughs> doctors posting on a Reddit forum. Uh, so this got a, a lot of press. These are real patient inquiries, and effectively they use the actual physician output along with G, uh, GPT-3.5's output, and the accuracy was very similar, and GPT-3.5 had higher empathy ratings. Here's an example of the quality ratings, large overlap, and then empathy ratings, you can see 3.5 is a lot better. Uh, in the press surrounding this, there was some I shouldn't say some argument from jilted physicians that this was just because GPT-3.5 has unlimited patients and could have longer output. But even when you control for length of output, people still prefer GPT-3.5's response. So getting to what I care about more, can large language models make diagnoses? There was a recent uh, study published with Palm, and I should note that Palm is a uh, I don't want to insult Google, but they're a little bit behind in the LLM race. They got scooped by uh, OpenAI. So this is Palm is, a, is equivalent to GPT-3.0 in terms of, it's not a state-of-the-art model, but BARD, which is powered by Palm, was able to solve cases similar to physicians for common complaints, though in more complex cases, humans still won out. Uh, this is a study that my team did, which uses these methodologies that were first developed in the 1970s for New England Journal CPC, so very complicated cases. And uh, GPT-4 was able to get the top diagnosis in 40% of cases, which doesn't sound particularly good, but humans performed 21% get the top diagnosis. So again, in an artificial setting, right, these are very curated cases that are used for didactic purposes. The large language models appear to do quite well compared to humans. Now, to what I'm really excited about, clinical reasoning. First, you need to define clinical reasoning, which is part of the problem. Uh, at Stanford, they did a really interesting experiment where they have a clinical reasoning exam that has been validated. It, it, we have established validity, at least in assessing Stanford medical students, but they gave it to medical students and then they gave it to the large language model and they did a Turing test where they graded both. And basically, GPT-4 
did better. It's not statistically significant, but it did better, and in particular in terms of having a robust differential. Google also evaluated the presence of clinical reasoning in one of their MedPalm papers published in Nature. It used a Likert scale, <laughs> which is, again, not what clinical reasoning researchers would do to evaluate clinical reasoning, but you can see that as their models become more specialized, they show, quote unquote, more accurate reasoning. Um, that's what we have. This is all that we know right now. I need to talk about bias in large language models. There's some interesting data on this. Large language models are, one, they're trained on the entire corpus, not the entire corpus, but they're trained on a massive corpus of human text. Uh, the massive, few, uh, you know, everything we write, there's the Bhagavad Gita in there, there's the Iliad, there's also Mein Kampf and the Anarchist Cookbook. So there are terrible things in the training data. They're also fine-tuned by humans who, I, I don't need to convince anybody, but humans have our flaws. So this is, uh, this is from some members of my research team, uh, both at Harvard and MIT, where they did two experiments, one where GPT created clinical vignettes, and effectively it massively overrepresented demographic stereotypes of disease. So here's an example of sarcoid. When asked to create, and we did, this was all done on the back end, but when asked to create cases of sarcoid, it dramatically overrepresented black female patients when the actual epidemiology is more like 50%. And you can see it does this in a number, we, we did this in almost 20 different uh, vignettes, but effectively it over-stereotyped. Then when we did management cases, uh, and this, I, I didn't run this experiment, but this was based on a study of human physicians taking care of patients with ACS, uh, GPT-4 did less quality of care in black female patients compared to white male patients. <coughs> okay, so that's the overview of where things stand diagnostically right now. Some questions that I think we should all be asking. One, how do LLMs actually change human behavior? This is called CHI, Computer Human Interface. How do they perform on unstructured data found in electronic health records? All the study, well, except one, all the studies that have been done look at vignettes, effectively structured, or progress notes, structured data. Clinical decision support does not traditionally work on structured data. So that's a really open research question. How do they perform actual reasoning tasks? Um, again, I don't judge uh, reasoning on a Likert scale, and this is something we've been thinking about in clinical reasoning for a long time. And then finally, very briefly, I want to talk about this meme, if anyone has seen this before. This is a monster from H.P. Lovecraft called the Shogoth. It was a really popular meme about eight months ago. It's holding up a smiley face, uh, and it says, I simply exhibit the behaviors that were engineered into programming by my creators. So LLM, LLMs are uninterpretable. They're, we have some experts here who may correct me and say, in fact, they are interpretable. CDS, for since the 1950s, has been interpretable, meaning if you have a question on why the computer gave you a recommendation, you can look at the back end and understand it. LLMs present a unique challenge in CDS that's actually much more akin to think about how we evaluate humans in that we can't see the back end. So what we're going to have to do in the field of clinical reasoning is think about how we continuously evaluate these clinical decision support systems. It's a problem we've never had in medicine, partially because the systems just haven't worked that well. Uh, any clinicians here know that CDS is used infrequently. And it's a huge challenge from a regulatory perspective as well, because software, this is in the US, but software as a medical device is not based on this idea of uninterpretability. Okay, that is it. I think I did it all in 20 minutes. Thank you very much.